Hey humans, Lyric here. I am a pale-skinned, non-binary human with short green hair and glasses. I'm wearing a gray t tank top shirt and sitting in an RV. This week, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that people don't seem to understand about sensory processing differences, specifically sensory overload. If you would like to know more, please do stay tuned. What is sensory overload? Well, for me, that is when some kind of sensory input, light, sound, touch, smell, a sensation on my skin, etc., and so forth, becomes so overwhelming to me that I either shut down, melt down, or run away from it because I am basically sent into almost a panic or just this need to stop or get away from and escape something that is currently agitating me within the environment around me. Some of my common triggers for sensory overload would be bright fluorescent lighting, certain smells, certain sounds just really get to me. Before I found out I was autistic, I thought a lot of this was anxiety and panic attacks, but then I realized there was actually some kind of environmental trigger causing this reaction inside me. If I use headphones or sunglasses or some other sensory protective gear or tool, I can prevent myself from being overwhelmed by the world that doesn't take my needs into consideration. The first thing I would love for people to understand about sensory processing and sensory overload is that a neurodivergent person with sensory processing differences ability to tolerate certain stimuli can vary from week to week, month to month, even day to day, depending on a variety of factors. One of those factors being how well rested or how well off that individual neurodivergent person is doing on that particular day. If the neurodivergent person is feeling like they are low energy that day, they've already got a lot on their plate, maybe they're already really stressed out about some personal thing or some change that's happening in their life, or they've not slept well all week. All of these things add up. Maybe you didn't eat breakfast and your, your blood sugar is a bit low. The perfect storm. These things happening tend to make my sensory overload more likely or make me more prone to having sensory overload. So that's my first question. Anyone else uh, who experiences this, what are some things that for you can make sensory overload and sensory overwhelm more likely to occur? Uh, I feel like when I am well rested, I've had plenty to eat, I'm well hydrated, I don't have a headache and I'm not sick and I am getting enough sensory regulation and I'm not stressed out. I don't have as many sensory overloads, but things like repeated exposure to sensory triggers and all of those other things I mentioned earlier can make those overloads more likely for me. What is it like for you? As we dive into sensory overload, it's really important for everyone to understand that each individual human being has their own unique sensory profile. And all of these individual settings for sight, smell, t 
touch, taste, how well you feel your sense of balance and where your body is in space, depth perception, these things, motor control senses, being able to control the fine motor control of your hands uh, or your mouth, my terrible handwriting, some autistic people who also have apraxia of speech where they don't have the muscle control in the mouth, all of these things can be impacted by having a sensory processing difference. And sensory processing differences are not exclusive to or unique to autistic people. People with ADHD also may have sensory processing differences, and there are a few other medical conditions that can also trigger people to have sensory processing differences. Uh, as I said, each human's sensory profile is unique, and even autistic person to autistic person, there are differences in sensory profile. What is pleasurable for me as one autistic person, or what is torture for me as one autistic person, for example, bright fluorescent lights give me migraines and seizures, those bright fluorescent lights might be necessary for some people to read. Some people love that. David loves those big, bright, annoying lights. I also can't stand being cold. And David gets hot easier. So our sensory needs are sometimes in competition with one another because even neurodivergent person to neurodivergent person or autistic person to autistic person, the way the sensory profile manifests is often very, very unique. There are also levels and types to sensory overload. There are steps sometimes in the process to getting overloaded where I start to feel a bit overloaded and the lights seem a bit loud and everything is a bit intense. I am on the way to a more intense complete overload where I may shut down cry or run out of a room very quickly when it gets to the point where eventually like a volcano building up steam and pressure something's got to give and I've got to remove myself or I will crash and burn some sensory overload actually can be quite pleasant there are pleasant types of overload. A lot of intentional stimming I do with lights. I'm light sensitive, but when I can control the little colored light toys and LED Christmas lights, when I control uh, the way <laughs> the lights present, because blinking and strobing is a problem for me, but like fading and slower motion and certain hues of lights are okay. When I have more control of that, it can be a pleasant kind of overload. Listening to music or ASMR, as ASMR, I probably said that wrong. I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Listening to those things, those clicky noises that people make with their mouths. If those give you the brain tingles, intentionally seeking that out. It's a little bit of an overload, but it's like, ooh, it's an overload I like. Uh, there are some other things you might could think about and name. I, I challenge you to name some pleasant types of sensory overload in the comment below that you would intentionally seek out autistic people. I I'll let you get creative. I'm not just going to name all of mine, but I'd love to know. Uh, that's the thing is the sensory overload. There is nuance to it. There is complexity. But I think neurotypicals don't understand. My sensory profile and my sensory processing differences are a pain in the butt sometimes, mostly because of how modern society is set up. I spend a lot of my time RVing in the woods away from the modern world and people and everything in it because it is soothing to my overworked senses. Neurotypicals don't seem to understand that even though it is difficult, I would never 
portrayed the way my brain processes sensory information because that would be giving up the way I feel music in every part of my body and the way I see things and visually process in my head and the way looking at those flip motion sand toys or other fun stim toys makes me feel. I love that stuff. I don't want to give it up. I just want the world to understand me a little bit better when I try to speak up for my needs and not to dismiss me and say things like nobody else is complaining or everyone else is fine or pressure me into going to places and doing things that I don't feel comfortable doing. Yes, maybe it's only going to be a few hours in this building doing this event, but I might have a migraine for the next week after this. What are some things that you wish people understood about having sensory differences and experiencing sensory overload? It sucks. That's what I'm going to say. It sucks. It's not an excuse. It sucks. But people often think you're making excuses a lot. All right. Thanks for hanging out with me this week on this video talking about sensory overload. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you found it educational or helpful, please hit that share button. And if you would like more, hit subscribe because I put out new videos each and every single Wednesday. Before I go, I do always like to say thanks to everyone here for watching the whole video. Thank you. Awesome. Watching it start to end. I'm grateful for that. Commenting and leaving your thoughts and your feedback and your suggestions for future videos. I'm grateful for that. Grateful to the Patreon subscribers and YouTube channel members and Facebook supporters, the people that do the little uh, monetary subscription that helps support features of this channel such as the web hosting and the transcriptioning software and all of the little things that make this blog the high quality that it is is thanks to the help of viewers like you so gratitude is very important to me that I show that to you because uh, this blog really wouldn't be possible without the help of viewers I am so grateful for all of you who are here today I will see you all next Wednesday later